So on Tuesday, we talked about the uh, fact that the government uh, can uh, uh, pass some policies that would actually uh, be, uh, lead us away from efficiency. Uh, for most products, most goods and services, uh, most parts of the economy, uh, just allowing the market to go forward uh, is going to be the way that we're going to achieve efficiency and maximize total surplus. Uh, as you recall, we would have our uh, graph with the uh, quantity on the x-axis and the price on the y-axis. Uh, the supply curve would slope up, the demand curve would slope down, and then uh, we would reach an equilibrium price and an equal the quantity would be on the x-axis, of course, and the equilibrium price on the y-axis where uh, supply and demand met. And we defined the area under the demand curve above the price as the consumer surplus, I'll shade that in blue, which is the difference between the willingness to pay and the price uh, that the consumers actually have to pay in the market. And producer surplus is the area above the supply curve, uh, below the price, which I'll uh, shade in green here, uh, which is the difference between the cost to the producer and the price that they get for the good. But the government may take some actions to influence the market, uh, and uh, these could lead to uh, an inefficient outcome. And so I'm going to run through uh, a couple of examples. And the first one I'm going to talk about is a price floor, where the government says that the price that you're going to charge for the good or the price that you're going to pay cannot go below a certain amount. It can be at that level or above. So uh, the example I'm going to talk about is the uh, market for butter. because often the price floors are used in the agricultural sector. And so we will uh, imagine an economy where, uh, in, the, in the market for butter, uh, if the price was at $10 a pound, uh, no producers would, uh, would produce. And of course, the supply curve would uh, slope up. And if the price were $25 a pound, no consumers would want to buy. So at that price, the quantity would be zero. This is, of course, the quantity, and this is the price. Uh, and we would have a demand curve that would be sloping downward. And let's assume that the uh, equilibrium price is $20 a pound, and that the equilibrium uh, quantity is 10, 10 pounds of butter. And so with this, we would easily be able to calculate our consumer surplus. So shade the consumer surplus in blue, just so we know what we're talking about. And the consumer surplus would be uh, half of 25 minus 20 times 10, uh, which is the uh, base of the triangle. This is the height, half that's I guess, is the triangle. And uh, so this would be uh, uh, 5 times 5, right, which is 25. So that would be the consumer surplus. And the producer surplus would be uh, from 10 to 20. Uh, so it's 20 minus 10, again, with by half. And the base, again, is, is 10. So uh, this would be uh, 50, right? Uh, so the consumer surplus is 10. Uh, excuse me, the consumer surplus is 25. The producer surplus is 50. Total surplus of 75 in the efficient outcome. But the government could decide that they're going to uh, put a price floor and then buy all of the butter that is produced and not, uh, and not uh, bought by consumers. And so let's say they put the price floor at uh, $25. Well, we know that at $25, no consumers are going to want to buy the good, but at $25, there will be 15 pounds uh, that would be produced by, uh, by farmers or by, uh, by butter uh, producers. And so uh, consumer surplus is going to go to zero because there's absolutely no consumer surplus. So let's, uh, let's do a little in red here, the after floor, the consumer surplus is going to equal zero, uh, but our producer surplus, uh, they're going to be able to get this entire area uh, is the consumer surplus, or excuse me, the producer surplus, so the producer surplus is going to be half of the price is 25 and then uh, t minus 10, and of course they're able to sell 15, so the base of the triangle is going to be 15 times 15. And uh, this is going to work out to 112.5. Uh, 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 but the big problem uh, for this outcome, so 
of course, the consumers, they're all buying margarine. They're not buying any butter, so they don't get any consumer surplus from butter. Uh, the the uh, butter producers, of course, are, are pretty happy because uh, their producer surplus has gone up from uh, 50 to 112.5, but the government has to buy all this butter. And so the government's going to have to pay the $25 uh, times uh, all of the butter, which is 15. So the government is going to have to pay uh, $375 uh, all for the sake of uh, providing the farmers with that additional producer surplus. Remember, it's not that they're paying them 375 so they can get the 112 uh, and a half. They're paying the 375 so they can get the difference between the 112 and a half and the 75. Because without this $375 payment, the producer surplus would have been, uh, excuse me, would have been 50. Uh, so, so the difference between so. With, so for $62.50 of producer surplus, and the additional sur surplus, it's costing the government $375. Uh, probably not the most efficient use of society's resources. Okay, so the next example I'm going to discuss is the um, example of, uh, of a government quota. And uh, to motivate it, we're going to talk a little bit about parking situation in Stores, Connecticut, the home of the uh, University of Connecticut's uh, uh, largest uh, branch. And um, as you may know, the university has actually given up one of its uh, pro uh, public parking lots, a uh, university-owned parking lot, and it's been uh, let the lease expire, and it's owned by a private, um, a private company. So why don't we assume, for the sake of this example, that uh, the university has gotten completely out of the parking business and is just going to allow the free market to go forward and uh, whatever private providers of parking uh, want to provide parking uh, can, and the university's not going to have anything to do with it. And we're just going to have a free market in parking in stores. And um, let's assume that there are uh, uh, people who are willing to provide parking on a per semester basis, and that if the price of the parking is $50 a semester, no one is going to provide it, and then the supply curve is going to slope up, and let's say if it's $700 a semester, uh, no one is going to want to buy uh, parking in stores, and that the demand curve for parking is going to slope down, and that uh, we would have an equilibrium of 1,000 parking spaces and an equilibrium price of $200 a semester to park in stores if uh, just on a totally free market uh, without any government um, uh, involvement. And now let's say the town of Mansfield, uh, which is the local town uh, that governs the municipality where the University of Connecticut Stores is located, decides that a thousand spaces is just too much. That's just too much pavement uh, in the beautiful town of Mansfield. And they are going to put on a quota and limit uh, that there can be no more than 800 spaces in the town of Mansfield. And just say, that's it. 800 and no more. Well. The consequence of this would be, of course, well, we obviously would have a quantity, it wouldn't be the equilibrium quantity, but we'd have a quantity of spaces of 800, uh, because the market equilibrium would be 1,000. Of course, if they had set a quota of, say, 2,000 spaces, then it would have had no effect, because it would have been above the equilibrium quantity. But a quantity uh, quota below the equilibrium quantity is what we would call binding, and it would be the maximum number of spaces. Um, and what would happen would be, these uh, 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 there would be producers who would be willing to supply that 100 spaces, and they would charge, uh, of course, off the demand curve at the 800 uh, space um, at the 800 space uh, uh, level, and that would be we'll just say for the sake of the example, 300 dollars uh, for uh, a semester under uh, after the quota. So. Um, who wins and who loses uh, in this situation? Well, clearly, the people that uh, uh, were paying uh, $200 a semester and are now paying $300 a semester, uh, they're losing. Uh, under the old system, before the, uh, I'll go back to the blue, uh, under the old system, before the uh, quota went in, uh, the consumer surplus was 700 minus 200, which of course is 500, and then we'll take a half of that, times the number of spaces available, uh, which is uh, 1,000. And uh, so this would be, uh, what, uh, 250 
thousand would be the uh, consumer surplus uh, under the old system, and we would have a producer surplus of uh, be this triangle, right? So that would be uh, half of two hundred minus fifty times a thousand, right? The quantity is still the same, and so this would be a um, hundred thousand. No. Uh, this is 150, 75 times 1,000, it's 75,000. Is the producer surplus uh, before the quota. And that would, uh, as I said, would maximize total surplus. Now, uh, under this new system, uh, with the quota, we have a, uh, and I'll switch to red, uh, we have, uh, uh, the, the consumers are losing, right? We have... These uh, consumers here who are paying more than they used to pay, so the consumer surplus is half of 700 now minus 300, and of course we don't have a thousand spaces anymore, we only have 800, uh, and uh, so those 800 people are paying more than they would have before the old system, so this is uh, 200, half of 700 minus 300, 200 times 800 is what, uh, 16, um, 160,000. So to uh, calculate the producer surplus, we first need to find the place where the quota line is going to hit the supply curve, and that's going to be at $170. And so the producer surplus is now in two parts. It's this triangle uh, below that 170, above the uh, supply curve, and this uh, this rectangle, which is the quota rent, which is the so that the total producer surplus remains uh, what it's always been, which is the area above the supply curve, below the price. And so, it's in two parts. This triangle is going to be uh, half of uh, 120, which is 150 minus, uh, 50, 170 minus 50, uh, so it's half of 120 uh, times uh, the 800, uh, which equals 48,000. And then uh, this rectangle is 300 minus 170, which is 130, times the 800, which is uh, 100, uh, 104,000. And so our total producer surplus is the 48,000 uh, plus the 104,000, uh, which equals 152,000. So clearly the uh, producers overall have gained from the uh, from the quota system, which is why once it's in place, it'll be very difficult for the town of Mansfield to uh, get rid of it. Even though there'll be uh, these 200 people looking for parking spaces, wanting to try to find them, and maybe even some uh, uh, parking lot owners that would like to be able to offer their spaces, uh, this additional uh, surplus, the 152,000 versus their old producer surplus of uh, just 75,000, uh, they're going to want to hang on to this, and they're going to uh, fight to keep it. Um, but of course there is a loss to uh, the overall uh, society, which is what we call the deadweight loss, which would be the area of this triangle, and so that would be half of this, uh, it's based on the idea that we have fewer parking spaces than we would want in an efficient equilibrium, so it's half of this 200, which is the 1,000 minus 800, uh, times uh, this, which is the 300 minus the 170, so that's 130. So half of 200 times 130 uh, is, or is, the, uh, is the dead weight loss, which of course is 130, uh, excuse me, it's uh, 13,000 is the dead weight loss uh, for this. And that's a, a function of the fact that there are 200 fewer spaces uh, than we would have in a uh, in an equilibrium.